Hello everyone to another Rive live stream. This is a really exciting episode. Um, this is the uh, first time that uh, at least I get to show off the game kits. And uh, what we'll be doing in this video is going to be uh, exploring uh, some of the game samples we've made with the new Rive game kits. And then after that, take a look at how we can build our first game. So whether you're new to programming or uh, Definitely new to the Rive game kits, it's the first one. Uh, this hope, uh, video will hopefully be helpful to you. And um, yeah, please feel free to leave comments. Uh, let me know if you have questions. When we get to the actual uh, tutorial coding part, it's going to be divided into seven sections. So seven steps to build the game that we'll be making. And uh, between each of those sections, I'll uh, glance uh, over and see if there's any comments. So if you have questions as the stream is going on, please uh, feel free to send them through. I'm just gonna verify that it is live and it is, it seems like we are. And uh, cool, yeah, uh, Tushar, I'm also very excited. Okay, so let us actually just commence and see what we'll be uh, delving into in this live stream. Okay, just some technical issue uh, with sharing my screen. Please <laughs> bear with me for 10 seconds while I sort this out. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> hopefully that will be the only glitch of the stream. Um, okay, so adding my screen finally. Uh, so as I said, this is going to be a look at the games kit. And if you haven't taken a look yet, I definitely recommend uh, checking out our website. Um, we have two pages of notes. The one is the game kit page and the other is the rendering page. And both of these provide additional information on what the game kit is exactly and what the new Rive renderer is. If you've been a long time fan of Rive, uh, you've probably seen us teasing the new renderer for uh, a few months now. And this is going to be your first look into using this uh, new rendering technology for yourself. And that is in the form of the Rive game kit. And it is um, made with Flutter or at least uh, the target is Flutter. So underneath, it's a Flutter application making use of the Rive renderer. And uh, that is how we are able to uh, basically draw a crazy amount of assets on screen. And that's good, what we'll be showing off in uh, this video. So yeah, if you want to take a look at this after the stream, if you haven't yet, these are some helpful resources. You'll see there's this link to example games. And this is uh, part of the examples that we'll be taking a look at today. Uh, there are two upcoming games that I'm not sure whether I should be sharing just yet. Um, maybe towards the end of the stream, if we have time, I can uh, show off some of those. Uh, those are two that are looking really, really cool. But yeah, I'm gonna be showing you the gel game, goblin game, and we'll be making Centaur. Please note though, for you to get access to the game kit at this stage, you will need to apply for access. It is still in technical preview. And during this time, it is limited access. Uh, so you would need um, that approval to actually uh, make use of the game kit. 
but definitely submit your form for that because the moment it becomes uh, public, we'll be notifying everyone or um, increasing the amount of people that get access to it. So let's actually delve in. This is going to be the character that we'll be using in our final game. But before we get to that whole part uh, of the video, I think it will be better if we just take a look at, uh, not in my face, uh, you're already seeing that. I think it will be better if we just see what the uh, game looks like. Uh, so to start off with, if you haven't uh, taken a look at, you can download the Joel game. And uh, I'm sure by now you've probably seen that floating around social media and on the website. And this is going, uh, this is kind of the hero game at this stage uh, to demo the uh, Rive game kit. And uh, yeah, you can play this yourself. There is a link on the website that you can uh, install this. It is quite uh, difficult. Uh, it's uh, difficult because like we want to show that the renderer is drawing uh, an insane amount of zombies on screen. Uh, by now I'm actually fairly decent at the game. I've, I've played it quite a bit. But yeah, we're not going to be making this. This is a more advanced game, uh, though the code is open source. So you can definitely take a look at this and you can also see uh, what actually goes into making a game like this. So that is the one example you can take a look at. The other one is called Goblin Slayer. This is making use of a different technique uh, of, uh, let me just run it. Uh, this, the code is uh, structured a little bit differently. We wanted to show another technique of how you can structure your code. And it makes use of a package called Oxygen, which is a Flutter package uh, made by um, Jochem. <laughs> and uh, he, <laughs> he actually advised me that I shouldn't be using it after I made the game. But uh, yeah, you can take a look at uh, this as well and the code for that. It's just a different way of uh, laying out your code. Uh, these two are a bit more advanced and unfortunately we won't be able to build them in a single live stream. But I'm sure we'll be making more content and uh, showing off uh, more things you can do, uh, more game related things I should say. Maybe it will be isolated tutorials, for example how to create a camera movement or a smooth uh, follow system. Okay, so leading into the main tutorial that we'll be doing, uh, we'll be looking at the Centaur game. And again, if you are a fan of Rive, you've probably seen this floating around for quite some time. We do have some live streams that uh, have covered how to create this with the JavaScript uh, framework we have. Uh, the difference being now that you can draw a lot more. Uh, the initial samples we had uh, definitely wouldn't have been able to render as many apples. And uh, I think it would be an interesting performance comparison for us to see like how much you can do with the new renderer compared to the, uh, the current uh, technology that we're using. So yeah, <clears throat> sorry, this is going to be the game that we're making. And we're going to be div dividing it into seven steps, as I mentioned. And yeah, please feel free to ask questions as we move along. I think now is a good time to probably take a look. Seeing a lot of hellos. Hello, Jeff. Uh, thanks for joining. And yeah, I see um, uh, Yin Lee mentioned that he only has a Mac, so he can't taste it. Uh, yes, at this stage, it, uh, it's only running on uh, Apple Silicon. And uh, the game is also compiled to only run on certain architectures. Um, as time goes on, we'll definitely be expanding those uh, or releasing more targets for the game. And ideally, uh, once it gets to the point where uh, the game kit can be used uh, from like a mass consumption perspective and it's outside of technical preview, then you should be able to build uh, to multiple platforms. Also worth noting, there is a lot of work being done um, from our side to uh, get the game kit working in uh, Chrome and eventually Safari as well. And uh, it's currently under a, uh, a flag that you need to enable to actually uh, run the game kit because the game kit makes use of some new technologies that require you, uh, that basically requires an update to Chrome. Uh, so that's very exciting. I'm sure that's uh, hopefully not too far in the, uh, far away. 
Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, but yeah, please feel free to comment as we move along. So the next step for us is now to actually get to uh, the juicy parts. So we're going to be making this game ourselves and we're already 10 minutes in, so hopefully it won't take too long. But also, I don't want you to get too scared if you have never developed a Flutter app or if you're new to development. Uh, hopefully this video at least can give you a taste of it. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to follow along. And uh, if not, it's, uh, it might just be entertaining to, to follow along regardless if I start struggling. Um, so yeah, as we can see here, this is a normal Flutter app. In the context of the Flutter land, everything is called a widget. And as you can see, we have these four widgets and these comprise of the application that we've made here. And as I mentioned, the game kit is made with Flutter. So all of the code is going to be Dart, which is the language that Flutter uses. And it also allows you, or it also means that you can technically mix and match Flutter, uh, normal Flutter UI rendering with the Arrive game kit, which is something that um, I think would also be powerful if you wanted to make use of Flutter's UI system, because it uh, it is an expressive way of uh, creating pixels on screen. So you can mix and match the two and use the base, uh, the base of both worlds. Uh, for the context of this game, everything is going to be drawn with Rive, uh, and Flutter is going to be responsible for the keyboard handling and obviously being able to run on Mac OS. But yeah, Flutter, using Flutter is very exciting for us because it also allows the game kit to be on multiple platforms uh, once the renderer is running on multiple platforms as well. So in a simple example, uh, if we update this and reload our application, you should see that it's reloaded. And that's a big benefit of Flutter. And it's also now going to be a big benefit uh, for the Rive game kit as well because it would allow you uh, to hot reload your game. So if you wanted to test out various zooms, for example, you can just give a new zoom, reload, and it, it should uh, automatically update for you. And I'm sure we'll see some of that in this video. OK. Um, I've preloaded this example application with a few important things for us. The first is I created this assets folder. And you can name this anything you want. Uh, ultimately, this is the way that you include files, external files, in a Flutter project. And as you can see, it's called Centaur v 2driv and this is your I file. Then in the pubsec file, there are two things you'll need to do once you uh, start experimenting with uh, the Arrive game kit. The first is to add the dependency. And as you can see, uh, it's hosted on an external uh, pub store called onepop.dev. And this is how we are currently providing access to the game kit. So once you receive an invitation from OnePub, you'll be able to uh, run these games locally yourself and start developing your own. And then finally, uh, if we scroll to the bottom, you need to add the assets to your application, just as you would for any normal Flutter application. You can be specific. You can say Centaur v2 if you wanted to, uh, or you can be more broad and say, include all of the assets in my assets directory. And that is the uh, base for what we'll need to do. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with Flutter, just some quick steps. Um, I'm also going to be going quite fast, at least in the sense of me using shortcuts. So um, from a coding following along, it's not going to be possible because you don't have access to the game kit as of yet. Uh, but depending on when you watch this, maybe in the future, um, I'd suggest probably just watching this and then later on you can just run the example yourself and refer back to this video to the uh, seven sections that uh, will be covered. Um, as you saw that there, I just used the shortcut and I'm converting the stateless widget to a stateful widget. And we're not going to go into how Flutter manages state, but uh, this is where we'll be storing some of the logic related to our game kit application. OK, so let's see if there are any comments before we delve further. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, so Jeff is asking if the project I'm working on today allows me to add text with the new renderer. Um, technically, yes, I can add text uh, to this uh, game if, uh, if I wanted to. Um, we have uh, an internal environment to test our uh, test our drive. So it's essentially a version of the editor before we release it publicly. Um, uh, depending on where you work, it, it may be called a UAT environment, a dev environment, or testing environment. Um, and that editor does have the text functionality. Uh, the Rive Game Kit also exposes some of the text functionality. If you take a look at the Joel game that I demoed at the start, uh, that uses uh, text uh, deformation and effects. And um, that is, uh, uh, yeah, that's an example of uh, text working in the game kit. Uh, we could look at that in the Joel game if there's time at the end and if you are interested, though it won't be in the editor, unfortunately. So it's just going to be seeing the code, uh, what it looks like. I can't share more than that. Do you expect more performance improvements with the Impeller release? Um, generally, this is a good question, and I think that's uh, probably an area that I should have explained a little bit better. Um, and this is something that I was confused as well when I first joined Drive and learned about the new renderer. This isn't uh, an, a rewrite of an API. For example, we're not changing the way that we use Flutz's rendering system. It's an entirely different rendering system or rendering engine, if you will. Uh, it doesn't use Skia and it doesn't use Impeller. It's um, from a technical perspective, what it's doing is it's using a custom C++ renderer that we built and that's drawing to a flutter texture area on screen. So uh, this isn't Skia, it's not Impeller. And uh, that's part of the reason that uh, we can optimize our Rive animations a lot uh, with the uh, this renderer. And uh, part of the techniques that the, uh, this new engine uses um, allows us to be able to uh, max out the performance. Um, but yeah, potentially with the Impeller release, I would say, it could definitely be interesting uh, if you think about it from uh, what Impeller might do in the future and the fact that you can mix and match Flutter UI and uh, the right renderer. So uh, I'm, I'm personally excited for what Impeller will do as well. Question, I'm assuming, assuming Rive doesn't use Skia Impeller. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, I, I guess I just answered this question. Um, Custom game engine, I wouldn't say custom game engine. I would definitely rather say, uh, I would distinguish it between the Rive renderer because eventually we want this renderer to be running across all of the different runtimes. So it will be running in the Rive editor, it will be running in the Rive game kit, uh, where it is now, and it will be running on iOS and Android uh, using no the normal runtimes as well. Uh, and potentially in other places in the, in the future as well. Uh, so yeah, custom game engine, uh, we're calling this a game kit. Um, and yeah, what the future holds, uh, not too sure. But um, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a question for what the correct terminology is. Um, okay, nice, thanks. <laughs> uh, digital acceleration says lacquer man lacquer. Uh, yeah, so they, they, they can hear by my accent that I'm South African. Uh, okay, Jeff, you asked, uh, can we see, the, uh, play the game you're building once you're done? I've lo I'd love to see the renderer displaying all of those apples in real time. Yeah, I, I do have to say, unfortunately, and I'm sure in the live stream as well, it doesn't really give the impact of the renderer. Uh, if you're running it natively on 120 FPS with vector graphics and it's like all smooth and crisp, it, it definitely hits different. Uh, it's a different experience when you can run it locally. Um, it's an excellent idea, uh, idea Jeff, uh, for us to um, potentially also uh, create down downloadable links for all of the other games that we're making, especially while uh, it is limited access. So thank you for suggesting that. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up with the rest of the team. Uh, but yeah, it won't be today because I, I don't know how I would share it. Okay, so let's continue. And just from like an admin perspective, I think it's gonna look better if uh, I tile this 
So then we can see the benefits of uh, Flutter's hot reload in action. Okay, my okay. So uh, if you're new to Flutter, if you ever do a hot reload and you see something like this, it may just require a hot restart. So that means that uh, from like a state level, Flutter doesn't even know doesn't know anymore what it should be painting where, uh, what what it should update in context of like the tree of uh, elements that it expects. So what that means is you'd need to do a hot restart. And that just takes a little bit longer, and it means you'll lose all of the state that is uh, saved. So you'll restart the application, essentially. OK, so let's jump into this. I'm also going to be copying some of the code as we're going along, uh, just because I don't want to be typing out everything. But I guess in the beginning, while we cover like some of the more fundamental things, it might be nice if I just show more of these steps. OK, the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding the Rive Game Kit package. So you'll be doing this uh, on every single new dot uh, file that you make. And for convenience, we are calling this, uh, we're giving it a, a namespace called uh, Rive. So meaning that if you want to access any of the classes, you'll need to say rive dot, and we'll be seeing that soon. And the reason for that is because some of the classes we expose and methods and names um, could potentially clash with Flutter. So it's, uh, I mean, you can choose how you do this. If you end up creating a Rive game, it maybe makes sense to uh, not do this and namespace the Flutter uh, as an example. But yeah, you can, you don't need that. So as an example, uh, what we will first do is we're going to be uh, creating a, a render texture. And it may seem very complex, but to a certain degree, you don't really need to understand what is going on. <laughs> you just need to uh, use it <laughs> if that's, that's pretty horrible advice. But uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of true for at least some of this. Um, conceptually, uh, we can understand what it does. Uh, let me make some more room on screen. OK, so the render texture, I previously hinted at this. This is the way that um, we are drawing the Rive content to the screen. And as I said, it's not Skia, it's not Impeller. It's drawing a texture to a, a flutter texture area. And this is what is uh, controlling that. And this is what will also create the widget that will allow us to display something on screen. And for now, we're not going to be using this just yet. But uh, yeah, we definitely do need that. The um, next thing that we can probably do, and it's uh, probably uh, should have done that a little uh, first, is we'll need to load the content for, uh, uh, we'll need to load the Rive file, excuse me. So I'm, uh, we can quickly walk through this. It's very similar to the current Flutter runtime. But essentially, you load the file, you read the file as a, as a uint8 list, and then you decode it, passing in the bytes to rive.file. And this will create a rive file for you. And this is also one of those semantics that technically you don't really need to care too much. Uh, it just needs to work. And eventually, this is where we'll be reading all of the artboard information, all of the uh, state machines, and the whole game is in a single Rive file. And this is probably a good time to mention that uh, this is the uh, Rive file that we'll be using. And we do have live streams that cover the creation of this character, I, I believe. So you can definitely find those in on YouTube. But uh, as you can see, we have multiple artboards. So we have a character, Apple, um, a background tile. So this is, for example, going to be our background. And if you look at the apple, uh, these are the apples that we're going to be destroying. And some of these have state machines. Uh, some of these are just normal assets. And very interesting, and this is the reason I chose this as a tutorial, is the fact that I think this is a good example of uh, where Rive is potentially a lot different uh, when it comes to game development, and definitely another advantage of uh, having interactive animations. If we take a look at the look target over here, and sorry if you can't read this, it's probably really small and I can't zoom in, but uh, you can see we have this target and the character is set up in such a way to look at this target. And 
if we take a look at uh, the constraints that are set up, and I'm not going to actually do that because I'm I'm not that skilled in the editor. Uh, but where these constraints are set up, it's set up in such a way that it follows the target, and it's follows it's following the target relevant to its world space. So wherever this is painted in the in the Rive world, if you if you want to have it. And this, uh, this is what will allow us to essentially tell our game kit to be like, here's the target node, let the character look at that. So it's going to be a very easy way for us, and you'll see, uh, to uh, make this character look at a certain place. And then eventually fire an arrow at that place. OK, uh, a lot of talking. So we're loading the file, and um, we need to initialize this. So Flutter has a method called init state, and in this uh, init state, this will be called a single time when the state of this widget is created. And the state of this widget is our my app widget. And you can call this whatever you want to if you if you uh, want to, I guess. Uh, we're going to call it uh, Rive Livestream Centaur. OK. Um, and in the net method, we're calling load. And you can see that uh, this is an asynchronous future method. And what this means is Flutter's way of handling things that will not happen immediately. And if you are coming from other languages, you may think that calling a wait on a future spawns a different thread, uh, but and it does not. All this means is that it's awaiting for this to finish before going on to the next line. And this is what allows us to eventually tell Flutter that, hey, the file is loaded. And we're doing this by calling set states. And this is the only Flutter code that we'll be going on over in this video. The rest is, is uh, in certain regards, easier. This is the setup is the most complex part. So once we've set the, uh, called set states, uh, we will need to uh, give it some, I'll update some of the state for our application. And you can see we, I've commented out this thing called Sensor Painter. And this is where the next step will come in for us. We'll need to uh, create a painter. And the painter is going to be what's responsible for painting all of the content on screen. And you can see I'm calling it Sensor Game. So we'll need to create that. So back in our lib folder, I'm going to create a new, fol uh, a new file. And we're going to call this Sensor Game. And the same thing, we're also going to do this namespace. And we're going to create a new class called Sensor Game. And this is going to extend uh, Rive. Uh, what's it called? It's called Render Texture Painter. OK, it's a mouthful. But this is going to be the thing that actually paints our Rive content to the screen. And you'll see you'll get a little error saying that uh, it's missing some uh, methods to implement. So I'm just going to create those two. And these are the only two methods you need to override. And as you can see, we have one that's called background color and one that's called paint. The background co color is going to be the color of the background of the texture. And the paint is going to be the area that you paint into the texture, the way that you get the size of the window or uh, the screen. Uh, no. Window is the correct word, not screen. And then the elapsed seconds. And the elapsed seconds is what's going to be uh, what drives your Rive animation. You pass this in to be like, hey, animation, advance by to to, uh, 0 0.16 second, or whatever the value may be. OK. And as an example, if we just pass in colors.red, so I'm importing uh, the needed package for that or uh, file for that. Uh, this will paint the background color to be red, but we're not doing that yet. Uh, so in the main file back there, I'm going to bring in that file. So I'm including that in our uh, current space. And what we'll be doing now is setting the Centaur Painter when the file is loaded. And I don't know why this is airing out. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's, it's erroring out because I haven't passed in the file. So that's something we can do right now before I forget. We're going to do rive.file. 
and we'll just call this uh, underscore file, sure. And we'll need to pass that in to our constructor. So if we call this final, it should do it for us automatically, yeah. Create constructor, so now, now we're passing in the file because uh, as I mentioned, the file is going to be containing all of our data and that's what we'll eventually read. And in the paint method, we are also gonna return true. And retur returning true means that you tell the uh, game painter to continue updating. So uh, essentially paint a new uh, method or recall this method each frame. So we'll always want to return true. And finally, uh, we're also gonna override the dispose. And dispose is also um, something that's native to Flutter or used throughout Flutter. Uh, this is the way that you get rid of any resources that you are using. And yeah, it's gonna be important for you to do this, especially if you start hot reloading and uh, yeah, potentially not hot restarting, but uh, at least from hot reloading, making sure that you free up any resources that you are using. And we're gonna be doing this more and more. Okay, so back in our main.dart file, now we're passing in the file and it's working and we can be good <laughs> citizens and immediately override this pose. And what we'll do is sense our painter, uh, call sense our painter dot dispose. So this is the method that we just made in sense our painter. And this will just ensure that we are disposing of our resources properly. And now, if we hot restart, we still won't see anything <laughs> because we're still painting the same. Uh, so what we'll need to do is do a conditional. And if we uh, check to see if the sensor painter is equal to null, this is a way to uh, write a one line conditional in a dot. Uh, we'll do the following. Uh, Sorry, uh, chat, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, code, uh, code Copilot is being too smart. Okay, and uh, sometimes it does help to read the error messages. So invalid constant value. And that's because uh, we're wrapping this parent to be a constant and it no longer can be because some of these values will change depending on the state. So in this uh, final version now, we're doing two things. We're saying loading or loaded. And if we <laughs> hot restart now, it should end with a loaded there. So now the next phase and final one in this step is for us to now uh, paint something. And this is where the render texture comes in. So we're gonna take that render texture and we'll pass it in and we'll call uh, widgets, I think. I think that's all we need. Uh, this will create a Flutter widget and we need to pass in the painter that we made. And the painter is the sensor painter. And we'll add this bang at the end, which just says, hey, it's not null, I promise you it isn't. And uh, yeah, we'll be doing that a little bit more. And unfortunately, that's a topic that I can't go into too much detail. Uh, yeah. But yeah, now we are painting our red background go uh, color, as you can see, as defined uh, over here. And what's important to note is that if you update this each frame, uh, you can do that. So you can have like a rotating set of background if you wanted. Or alternatively, you can just paint one artboard over all of this and you don't care about the background color. But as an example, I changed it to blue. I'm pressing R to hot reload and now it's blue. Alternatively, you could also make it transparent and now it will paint what's ever behind, uh, what's behind this. So in that way, you can use Flutter and Drive together. For example, uh, you know, paint Drive on top of a Flutter uh, app if you wanted to and just set the background to be transparent uh, if you want, still want to be able to see the content that Flutter is rendering. But I'm just gonna take the color that we need for our final application. And uh, this is a fixed color. So here I'm passing in the hex value of the color 
And if we reload, you can see this is going to be what the final uh, color is. And just for consistency, currently I'm adding the whole material package. Or we don't need that. We can uh, just add painting, uh, just because we only need the color class. It doesn't really make a difference, but uh, some people are uh, <laughs> very uh, annoying about that. Okay. Uh, this is the end of our first step uh, of uh, part one, I guess, and that is done. So let's see if there are any questions. So Jeff asked, uh, so all the arts and animation are within the arrive file, but the way they're arranged in the game logic all happen in Flutter. That is correct. Um, so yeah, the logic and the game input mechanisms are handled with Flutter and the game kit allows you to efficiently paint the arrive animations and it exposes a few helper methods and things like that to make it easier. Um, in the future, this could be different. Uh, maybe, yeah, it, I guess it depends. But um, at this stage, as well as while well it's in technical preview, um, that we are definitely looking for feedback uh, with regards to the API, API behind the game kit. And um, we're uh, very open to what the initial uh, creators that use the game kit uh, use are going to say. And I'm sure the end goal is to make this uh, as convenient and easy to use with whatever form of helpful API that, that may involve. Or maybe it involves like a step further than that uh, to expose more of this from uh, within Rive. Okay. I don't see any new questions coming in. So let's move on to the second step. I'm going to look at my cheat sheet, uh, what that is. Okay, next up, drawing the character. Cool. Now we are done in the main file for now. And uh, later when we start doing uh, inputs, we'll jump back to the main file. Uh, okay, so let's start with the character. And we'll start off by creating a new local variable called character of type artboard. So uh, this is the artboard, the character artboard over here. So we need to take note of the name, which is called character. And you know, I'm just gonna change this now. It's a little bit far away. Okay, and uh, instead of passing it in as uh, a constructor argument, we are instead, um, we already have the file. So all we need to do is load the artboard. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm even using Copilot because like yeah, Copilot doesn't know about uh, the new game kit yet. Uh, so what we'll do <laughs> is uh, let me see. Yeah, okay. So it's called underscore file, which we have, and we'll call artboard, and then we pass in the name, and the name for that is Centaur. And as you can see, it's giving an issue because uh, it can be null. Uh, if you say dot .artboard, uh, the file doesn't know if it exists. You are seeing if it exists, and it will tell you if it does exist by returning either a value that is a null, which is the artboard, or an, uh, the value that is null. And that is denoted by the question mark at the end there. Um, how you handle this, uh, it's up to you. Uh, in my opinion, we can just add a bang uh, because one, we know it exists, and two, if it doesn't exist, our game should crash. So uh, as an example, if we had a, a name that's spelled wrong, we hard restart, you can see we get an error, unhandled exception, null check operator used on a null value. And that's because it doesn't exist. Uh, but if it does exist, uh, what is the issue now? Maybe I spelled it wrong. Oh, it's not called Centaur, it's called Character. So me trying to be smart ended up not being smart. But now you can see uh, it's working, it's not giving an issue, and we're saying it, it does exist. And yeah, just trust us, uh, Dart. Okay, so now finally we can paint it to the screen. So the first step in painting something is creating a new renderer. 
and you do that by calling make. And if you were fast and the stream isn't too slow, you may have noticed three other methods there. Uh, make, make paint, make path. Maybe they will be more in the future. But uh, this is a way for you to be more expressive in code as opposed to doing everything in Rive. Uh, you could, for example, create uh, your own paint objects in code, pass that into the Rive renderer, uh, or you can make your own paths. So in our guides and uh, getting started docs, you'll see there's a section on using this API where we show you how to like draw a star. That's all code. Where this gets really interesting is you can do more advanced things. For example, in the gel game, uh, we have uh, a lot of trees that are painted to the side, and those trees are all the same color, and they all pass a shadow down to the character that's below it. And uh, this API is combining or creating a single path from all of those trees and then making one path object for all of them. So it's essentially like, uh, inter like it's if you think about this from like a design perspective, it's like combining all of the different objects and creating like one path that's more efficient to draw. And then you can also pass one single paint to it, which could be one color or gradient or whatever you want. So yeah, this is just, uh, yeah, I'm just mentioning that. In this video, we're not gonna take a look at that. We just need make because we need this renderer object uh, to actually do the um, rendering. <laughs> So the next step is we take our character, call draw, and we pass in the renderer, and save. And if I, I hot reload it, you can see the character is on screen. So, you know, cue the applause, we have something. <laughs> we have something on screen, and uh, it's, it might not look like much, you know, but we, we got something. But you can see the character is not doing anything. And this is where the elapsed seconds comes in. And uh, this is something that's nice about the game kit is uh, it's not a, ma a matter of you pressing or saying play state machine. You need to advance the state machine yourself. And you are free to do this in whatever way you, you want to. And you may think that sounds like a hassle, but it allows you to be more efficient with how you are advancing a lot of animations. And we're gonna be seeing that once we start drawing thousands of apples on screen. But for now, we'll need to still get reference to the state machine. If we take a look at this character, go to animate tab, go to the motion state machine, which is the only state machine, press play. Uh, this is the motion, uh, let's just zoom in. And we have this fire. It might be difficult to see on stream with the colors. But yeah, that's uh, the state machine we need. Okay, so I'm just gonna bring that in. That's not what I want. Okay, it's called final arrive state machine. And we'll call it character state machine. Let's just call it character machine. Okay, and um, this one, we're gonna be doing a bit different. Uh, because we get the state machine from the artboard, not directly from the file. Uh, it would mean that we can't initialize it as a final attribute directly because we need to do it uh, within Angular brackets here. So we'll do character machine and we'll say character and state machine by name is not correct. You would either say a state machine and you can pass in the name and we know that the name is motion or you can say dot default state machine which will give you the default state machine or if there's only one there is uh, it will give you that one you can also say default artboard if you know there's only one artboard but that's not the case for uh, this file okay so but you can see we have an issue character can't be used as a setter because it's final and we also can't do it directly in the constructor because it's coming from the character artboard that needs to be initialized and it's uh, it's not initialized at this point. So uh, we'll be making use of something called late and this is another promise telling Flutter, hey, I promise I'm gonna initialize this later. And adding a bang at the end because I'm saying, hey, it's definitely not null. 
Okay, so the last step for us is now to take this character machine and call advance, passing in the elapsed seconds. And if we press hot restart, hot restart, sorry, uh, you can see the character is now moving. And it may be a little bit hard to see uh, on, uh, on stream. So this will be a good lead way for what we should probably do next. And that is gonna be modifying what the character looks like or modifying the render in such a way that's, uh, yeah, would be what, that's the main way that you draw anything on screen uh, or compose your scene. That's the better word to describe it. So what we'll do is as a quick example, uh, we'll say, uh, hmm. yeah, let's do transform. Um, yeah, we'll do transform and we'll say arrive matsud from scale. Uh, <laughs> I should have maybe said this, told you this at the start. Uh, there's a little bit, there are some dragons on this uh, stream because there are some math. Uh, I'll do my best to explain it, but uh, yeah, uh, it's definitely something that you shouldn't be scared of, and it does allow you to be extremely, extremely expressive in what you want to do. Uh, to do. Um, so, in this example, what we're doing is we're telling the renderer to transform, and it requires a matu d, and a, a matu d is a matrix that has a dimension of two by two. But uh, technically, actually, uh, in code, it is a three by three matrix because it also accounts for translation, not just scale. And you don't need to know too much about this. Um, we're gonna be doing more examples and I think some of it will be clear as we go on and do more of this, uh, this demo game. But I have to say that if you are interested in learning more uh, from a pure mathematical perspective, I do recommend uh, taking a look at our documentation. So if you go to uh, help.rive.app, you'll see there's a section for Arrive Game Kit, and you'll also see there's a section called Paint and Layout. And this gives some of the fundamental concepts, as which is most of which is probably going to be covered in this video, but in a different way. And it's a uh, it's a it's a good getting starting point. And uh, there's also more advanced topics uh, in the uh, this documentation that you can definitely refer to. But what I'm trying to get to is that in this, there is a link that uh, we added uh, specifically because uh, you may be new to uh, the math needed for game development. And there is this excellent series of videos uh, made by 3Blue1Brown, uh, The Essence of Linear Algebra. So definitely give that a watch. And the reason I'm suggesting this is because uh, from a mathematical perspective, you don't really need to understand it, but if you can visualize it, that's more powerful. And matrix multiplication uh, and ma manipulation is visualization. And luckily, part of this game tutorial, you'll be able to visualize what we'll be doing because uh, we're gonna be doing it and visualizing it. But give that series of videos a watch if you want to learn more. Okay, so I rambled on. So what we're doing, we're transforming the renderer to be a bigger scale. And we're using this convenience method from scale to create a matrix that uh, has a two by two scale. So it will increase everything by a factor of two. If we save now, you might have seen it. It was really fast. The character went and like it just like each frame like increased. So like uh, it didn't restore itself essentially. Like each consecutive frame, the renderer got bigger by scale too. And as I'm like blabbering on, this is continuously happening because we're calling paint uh, each frame. So how do we stop this? Uh, well, you need to tell the renderer to first save its state and then do the transform and then do the draw and then restore to the previous state, please. And then if we hot restart now, you can see the scale is bigger and the, um, uh, it's not doing the, the problem we had. And this save and restore is incredibly important because this is what will allow us to combine our animation in a, or allow us to composite our scene. If I do the following as an example, we'll keep this, this one at a scale of two. And we're also gonna do a render 
.translation, or translate, sorry. And we'll translate this by 500 pixels in the y-axis. And we'll save. Now we have two, okay? So this saving and this restoring, and this is what allows us to transform the render space in a one condition, do something, apply a new condition, do something. And you may wonder, okay, why did I give a 500? If we look at the method signature, it's a double Y. So this is in the Y axis. In the X axis, we're not moving it. We're just moving it in the Y axis. Why is plus 500 going down? And depending on what you are familiar with, there are different Cartesian coordinate systems. What Flutter uses and what the GameKit uses is a uh, a coordinate system that goes from uh, right and down. So essentially, um, if you are positive x, so increasing to the right side, and positive y, going down. If you want to go the other route, you would just decrease it uh, naturally. So instead of uh, going plus 500, you can go negative 500. So as an example, we can say negative 100 in the x, and that will go left. And yeah. That this is something that you can play with the game kits and just experiment with. Okay, I think that is that for this section, getting our character on screen. Let's see if there are any questions. <laughs> um, okay, Gilberto says, love this VS Code theme. What is it called? Uh, I'm feeling guilty because I'm been, I've been using it for like months and I keep getting a pop-up that I haven't paid for it. And you'd think I'd remember what the theme is called and I don't. Uh, color theme, it's called a Monokai Pro. So it is paid for, but I haven't paid for it. So you'll just need to ignore the pop-ups, but I am plan I'm planning on paying for it 100% because I've, uh, I've been using it for quite a bit and I, I really like it myself. Okay, moving on. Um, we're gonna go to the next step, the third one. And that's going to be drawing the background. And then we'll also be doing some resizing. So creating some convenient ways for us to determine what our world size is and placing our character and background in proportion to that. So this is a very important step, uh, although it's, it's probably a bit of a boring step. Okay, uh, we'll keep this in as is for now. I, I do want to say though, like if we start re, uh, dr sizing, dragging this, uh, you can see it, it stays consistent. We'll maybe need to play a bit more with this as an external window in this section, but yeah, we'll see. Okay, so similar to how we got the character at bot board, we'll also need to get the background tile. And that's going to work in the exact same way. And now we'll just get the background tile, file.artboard background tile. And finally, Copilot was helpful by <laughs> actually suggesting the correct code. I think that's correct. If we hot restart, it gives an error. So unable to do the null check. Uh, so I guess that is not correct. Oh, okay. Um, it's because it's spelled like this. Okay, and yeah, very important, name your artboards consistently. Uh, okay, so we have the background tile. The next thing that we're gonna do is just, I guess, uh, yeah, we've, we've already seen how to draw things, so I think it makes sense uh, for us to delve into going straight into like the more complex stuff. I'm gonna remove uh, this one, restart. And I'm just gonna copy in the code. And let's go through this step by step. The background scale, uh, for now, let's ignore it. I'm just gonna set it to one uh, because it might be clearer later. And you can see we have this for loop. And you can set this up in whatever way you want, but this is going to be just a convenient way for us to draw, uh, I guess in this instance, it's going to be five, uh, yeah, five. Uh, five artboards from left to right. And uh, as you can see, at the start of our loop, we call save. At the end of our loop, we call restore. So in a similar way to how we saw previously. And here we're using our from scale 
And this is how we create the scale of the artboard. So this is going to be effectively how big the artboard is. For now, it's just one, which is actually the equivalence of an identity matrix. So it would be a two by two matrix would be one, zero, zero, one. Uh, so if you multiply this matrix with another matrix or with a vector that is as a size of uh, two, for example, you will not change uh, the, the value. It will be consistent. But if you increase this to two, you scale everything up by two. For now, let's keep it at, at one. And this also demonstrates how you can, um, I guess, more efficiently modify your matrices. What we're doing over here is we're setting the fourth argument of our matrix, uh, which is going to be the X translation. And there are multiple ways that you can do this. As we previously saw, we called a renderer.translate, and then we translated it with the X value. But it is more efficient to just do this once. So you just do your transform call a single time. We can do this though. We can ignore this. Uh, let's copy this out. We can ignore that and just say render.translate. And then pass in that as the X value. But uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's probably better just to do that operation once. So here we're directly setting the X value, uh, X translation value for our matrix. And that is going to be uh, a combination of the scale times by B, which is going to be the first time negative two, then negative one, then zero, then one, and then by the size of our artboard. And if we take a look at the background tile, this is the artboard, it has a, uh, a variable called bounds, which is an AABB, which we'll get into in a moment, but this has a property called width, and this is going to be the width of the artboard. So what this means is if you define an artboard like this character, it has a size of 500. That means that this width here is also going to be 500. So if we save this now, just do a hot restart or hot reload, you can see we're drawing one, two, three, and like it's actually drawing more to the left. So if we like make this bigger and so hot restart, oh, actually I'm lying. I guess it's just doing that. Um, but I, get, I think you get the, oh, I think I know why. I remember now, we'll get to this. Um, but yeah, you get the idea. We're drawing them consecutively from left to right. Um, if we set the scale now, uh, you can see now it's suddenly a lot bigger. And it also means that the width needs to be bigger. And that's where this calculation comes in. So now we're only showing like this one uh, in the full span. But if we increase the size, we can see a little bit more. OK. Um, that is a good start, but we do have a problem. The <laughs> problem is, is that our uh, background is not, it's floating in the middle of the screen and our character is painting uh, at the top left. And that is something I failed to mention earlier. Um, when I talked about the uh, coordinate system that we use, um, going from right and down, uh, if you just draw something, it's going to be centered to the top left. So this artboard you can imagine is uh, centered there, top left and going down like this by 500, 500 right, 500 up, and the character is centered in the middle. And that is, uh, it's, it's going to be axis aligned to the top left, which is essentially the coordinates of zero, zero. And if we take a look at this character artboard, the origin for this, I uh, actually don't know where the or origin is. Um, but yeah, you can imagine that this is going to be the first thing that's drawn, whatever's pointed right there. So what we want to do instead is uh, we don't care about the alignment of our uh, of what's defined in the arrive editor, at least not for this example. We want to turn that off. And we also want to tell the renderer to basically make use of the full screen real estate that is available and then to appropriately size our assets to go down. So how do we do that? Um, that is where uh, a little bit more math comes in. So to start off with, I'm going to comment out this and I'm going to uh, create something called a view transform. And the view transform 
is going to be a matrix 2D, similar to how we saw previously with the scale and setting it like this. But it's going to be making use of a convenience method um, that the Rive Game Kit provides, and it's called compute alignment. Um, function expressions can't be named. It's weird. Uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, I think that's just a fake error. Uh, okay, so uh, what this needs, it needs a box fit, alignment, uh, AABB, which we'll talk about now, for frame and content. So this is where it seems a little bit more familiar if you've been using Rive to do anything in the past. Uh, you may have uh, done similar things to fit and alignment. If you are familiar with Flutter, you would also be familiar with the box fit because box fit essentially comes from uh, Dart or from, from Flutter. And it provides like a variety of convenient uh, defaults, not only defaults, but like options. And let me just try and get code completion. There we go. For example, we have contain, cover, full, fit with. For this example, what makes sense for us is contain. So what this will mean is it's going to contain the animation to, uh, or the artboard to a, a given size that we have. Uh, alignment is going to be the uh, what you imagine it going to be. You can have uh, different alignments, like top center, left, right align, center. And in this instance, we want everything to be aligned to the bottom center of our screen. And now this frame, this is going to be the interesting part. This is going to be uh, the way that we tell this computation how big of uh, how big our, our screen is. So you can think of the frame as, as going to be the window area that you want to draw into. And to calculate this, we need to create or pass in something that's called an AABB. And this is called an axis aligned bounding box. And it may sound scary, but uh, it's it's really not. It's essentially a box. And uh, it's not just a box in the sense of like drawing a square. It's a box in relation to uh, the 2D vector space or uh, 2D space, if you will. and. Essentially, if you modify the render in such a way that you scale up uh, everything by a factor of two, an axis aligned bounding box would take that into account. Um, I'm probably explaining it pure, pu uh, poorly, and uh, luckily we did write uh, documentation on that. So please read uh, the section on axis aligned bounding box. Um, this is a little bit longer explanation of on what they are. Though I think by the end of this video, you'll have a little bit better understanding of what it is just by naturally watching and seeing how it works. But yeah, uh, from like a visualization perspective, uh, I think imagine it as a box because it is. And what we're saying here is we are giving A, B, C, D, so from values, and this is going to be the points. And essentially what that means is we're saying that the points that start are here, 0, 0, top left, and then here, bottom right, which is the size.width and size.height. And you might have noticed that there are a few ways to create an AABB uh, from like different values. You have from min max, from points, from values, and these are just different ways of creating a bounding box. It may make sense sometimes to use one over the other, we're going to be touching on a few uh, in this video. OK, but let's see. Uh, you, we can see we also have content. And content is going to be what you draw to the screen. So for now, let's actually take our character and pass in the bounds. So if you remember, we were able to get the bounds of the background tile, which is the width. And this is an AABB. And that is because the width simply calculates what's the left point of the box and the right point, and that must be the width. So it's subtracting the two. Here we're passing in the character bounds. So the character bounds is 500 by 500. If we save this now and do a hot restart, uh, it breaks because I'm not drawing the character. What we'll do is call render.save, transform, and we'll pass in the view transform restore, uh, draw our character. And for the purpose of the character state machine, we are always going to want to advance our character. So I'm just going to move that to the very top. Save this. And for now, let's not do the background. 
Now you can see our character is bounded to the bottom left, depending on our screen size and depending on the character size. As an example, if we are to say that the height of our uh, frame is uh, divided by two, then it's going to be only drawing it to this portion of the screen. Because now we're saying our bounding box is from zero, zero to the middle here, which is half of the width. So I, that gives you an idea. And the content is the size of the content that we're painting. And here we're saying that uh, the content is 500 by 500. So this will basically ensure that our artboard is filled to the whole section of the screen. Um, and very interesting, well, not very, but interesting. Uh, if we now say, for example, top center, then it should align it to the top center. Yay. Uh, contain, if we wanted to, we could say uh, fit height. Now it fits it to basically always be the value of the height. Uh, but yeah, this doesn't work for us in this one. So fit width, maybe that's better. Now it will fit for the width. And you may be like, why isn't the character all the way to the left? Because you need to account for the sizing that's between the character and the artboard. So maybe it makes sense for this character artboard to be smaller. Depends on your game, I guess. But you can see now it's trying to fill the width. But we want contain and we want it bottom center. And we can save. And now the next part uh, is to draw this background. And I'm just going to comment this here and say this is background. OK, and um, if we save, you can see it's not being applied to the background. Why is that? Well, that is because we're restoring it before we're doing the background calls. So this view transformation, we want to make sure that that restore is happening after the background. So if we save this now, oh, nothing. <laughs> so not good. You may be confused. Uh, I was too initially. It's luckily a quick fix. And the reason it's doing that is because the alignment uh, that we're setting for the origin points in uh, Rive is kind of messing these up. Uh, at least that's how I understand it. What we need to do is we need to ensure that the character dot frame origin equals false. So if we save this, you can see it doesn't do anything for the character. I'm hoping for the background it does do this. Otherwise, it's going to be some debugging. Yay. OK, it's working. Uh, though we have a problem again. Now the background is being drawn over the character. So not ideal. And this is going to be uh, important. The way the order that you draw these, these pen calls is going to be the order in which uh, they are finally drawn. So because we are drawing the character before the background, it means it's going to be behind the background. So all we need to do is simply move the character draw command to the bottom here. And for now, I'm also just going to comment this and just say character, just so we can easily find this later. OK, so now it's starting to look good. But uh, the problem now is that <laughs> regardless of this uh, screen size, we're always increasing the size of our, our thing. We don't really want that. We want a fixed size for our character. We want them bounded at the bottom, and we don't want uh, it to decrease, increase depending on like our window size, because eventually we want to zoom out and be able to see, uh, you know, all the apples. Um, and we want to also want to support various different screen sizes. Okay, so that's going to be the next thing that we try and solve, and. For that, I'm going to copy in the code we need. We're going to go above this paint method. And I'm going to paste this method called scene bounds. Okay? And this is just a way that we are creating an AABB. And I'm going to touch on this in a moment, but let's just pass it in. So instead of the character bounds, so instead of saying that our bounding box is 500 by 500, we're now going to be passing in this value over here. If we save this now, Cool. Uh, we actually get something going. It's very small at the bottom uh, over there. But 
um, it's starting to look better. And also, if we scale it up, oh, that's interesting. I'm actually not sure why it's doing that. I, okay, we'll, we can explore. Maybe I missed something, but we'll we'll just continue. Um, what this scene bounce does, though, is it is effectively saying that uh, we want there to be some padding on the left and right of the character. Uh, so, for example, previously we only passed in a scene bounce of 500 by 500. Now we want to increase this a little bit. And you can technically do this in whatever way makes sense. As an example, instead of returning this value, we could return um, We could just return 0, 0 and make it really big. So maybe like 3,000 and 500. I, I don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah, that breaks it. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that what this inset does, bounds.inset, it's a way for you to actually pad in your, uh, your bounding box. So we're padding in our bounding box with the character width. So essentially, uh, it's putting one extra character size to the left and one extra character size to the right. But you can modify this in different ways. Uh, I think the correct approach would probably be uh, creating rive.aabb uh, from min max. Yeah, I think that's probably the correct way. And this takes in a vec2d and you can pass in value. So vec2d is uh, going to be a, a, a vector of size 2. And the minimum is zero. Let's hope this works. Uh, and for now, let's put the maximum 500 as well. I just want to verify that I'm understanding it as well correctly. OK, interesting. Um, hmm. Disregard what I'm saying here. Uh, do as I do, not as I say. For the purposes of this tutorial, we'll just continue with the scene bounds as is, and we'll not we'll not delve into more of the mathematics. Uh, okay, I think that's the end of this tutorial. Uh, this section, sorry. Um, we have a character at the bottom of the screen, and we have it sized a little bit appropriately, and we have a background uh, as well. So the next step is going to be uh, step four which is going to involve player movement inf input. So we're going to be moving our character around. Let's see um, if there are any new comments. OK, Gilbert says, loving the new contents. I use Riveway back for a simple splash screen. The game kit looks amazing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you can do now so much more <laughs> than just the splash screen. And then Jeff is dropping off. Uh, but yeah, welcome, Jeff. OK, so moving on to the next section. What is the time? Pushing 6, 6.13 already. As it going on really long? Um, I think we're going to just speed up some of this. Uh, if we take a look at the main artboard now, uh, this is uh, main dot dot, sorry. This is now finally the place where we can have some input. OK, I'm just going to replace in the file contents we need. OK, so what we're doing here, I extracted or just copied in some new things for us. And the first thing is called a focus node. And focus nodes are the way that Flutter receives focus to particular widgets. And it uh, also provides you a way to listen to key events. So what this means is, in the end of where we're creating this um, uh, this class, we're calling request focus, and that essentially allows us to say, hey, in the scope of this context, focus on this Flutter, and then you'll be able to access the key events that are registered within that focus. And this happens within this callback on key event, which is uh, gives you a focus node and an event. And <clears throat> depending on this, you can create your movements. So, this logic over here is what's driving us, uh, allowing us to get the uh, keyboard inputs for A and D, which will be left and right. And depending on whether it's pressed down or an event that goes up, 
we are increasing the speed either by plus one or negative one. So interesting, <laughs> but it currently it won't get work yet. And the reason for that is because we need to uh, implement this logic in the sensor game. So if we jump uh, back to our sensor game file, um, we're going to be, be exposing a few new things. Uh, the first thing that we're going to expose is a variable called move. And the move is going to be used to determine uh, whether we should be moving, not moving, moving left or moving right. And as you can see here, we're setting this variable in the sensor painter, depending on the speed. And it can be zero, one or minus one. Okay. And now if we go to the paint and just print move and restart, you can see it's zero, zero, zero. And if I start pressing, it's one. And if I go left, it's negative one. So we're getting there. Uh, now we just need to pass that on to the character. So the next thing is we'll need to get a number input for the state machine. So if we take a look at the state machine, you can see we have this move input. And if we play, it can be zero or it can be one or it can be negative one. Then the character moves backward. Well, so negative one will move backward, negative two as well. And it's also like applying different speeds, I think. So we need to get this move input, which is a number input uh, called move. So the code for that is uh, duh, duh, duh. in the background. I guess we can do it just here. Uh, let's move it up, keep our code clean. So in this, uh, what we're doing is we're setting the variable, uh, which can be null. Uh, we're saying character machine number, get the one called move. And then finally in our paint, uh, where we have our character, Ooh, let me see. This is where we will set it. So we'll set the value equal to move. If we do a hot restart now, and uh, let's do a hot restart. Now, if I press right, you can see the character is actually moving. But um, one thing I would like for us is to actually be able to visualize this a little bit better. As you can see, it's it's quite small on screen. Uh, so let's set the uh, do do do. I guess it's fine. We're going to be doing uh, this more. Uh, let's let's leave it as is. Okay, so uh, the character is moving with the uh, animation playing at least, but we also need to update the character's position. And for that, we'll need to do uh, the calculation. So for this character, where we get the move, after where we set that, I'm going to pass this in. And um, this will allow us to determine what the movement speed is for the, the uh, character. So I'm just going to create a new variable. And uh, we'll put this after move. It's called current move speed. And this is going to be a combination of our target move speed, which is going to be uh, a fixed value, essentially, uh, depending on a move speed. So I'm saying speed a lot. Let's import min. But what this does, it allows you to smoothly interpolate the speed. So if you start moving, it doesn't immediately jump to a movement speed of 100. It takes in the elapsed seconds and it slowly interpolates over that to basically go from like zero to a target move speed. And this current move speed is the thing that will finally set our character's X position. Definitely take a look at this in your own time. But uh, yeah, you can experiment with it as well. It's going to be dependent on like the type of movement system you want to make. But effectively, if you want to make the character move faster, all you need to do is make the movement speed faster, uh, which is this value over here. OK, so this character x, what we need to do now is set the value for that. So 
uh, before we draw our uh, character renderer, we'll translate the renderer by the character's exposition. So if we save this now and press right, you can see the character is moving. And left, the character is moving backwards. And you can see that uh, the legs are also like appropriately moving uh, backwards or forwards. And that's all set up in the state machine. OK. Um, as an example, if we make this uh, 300, then the character movement speed is increased. So yeah, it's going to be uh, set up, need to be set up in a way that makes sense for, for your character. I think that's the end of this section. Let's see if there are any comments. No new ones. So let's just push on because uh, the stream is getting long. Uh, step five. OK, so now we'll add the functionality to target our player cursor. Uh, or mouse cursor, sorry, and then allow the character to look in the correct direction. So back into main, this is uh, going to require us to add Flutter code again. We'll wrap this widget in a new widget. And what this is going to be is, is a mouse region. And in this mouse region, we'll create a on hover uh, callback, which will get an event. And this event is of type pointer hover event. And essentially, what we'll need to do is call uh, our uh, since our painter passing in the value of our hover position. OK, uh, so as you can see, we haven't made this method yet. So in our sense our painter, uh, we're going to go there. And I'm going to add this new method called aim at. Let me just get the code. OK, there we go. Um, just going to copy it in. OK, so what this gets, the value that it gets, is a local position. And that's going to be the window position of the mouse cursor. So just to actually visualize this before we uh, do this bottom step, Let's print the value. So print the local position. And in main.dots, this should be fine, I imagine. Uh, what is the issue? OK. So now if we hover, uh, you can see it, uh, it's printing the offset. So uh, here it would be 0, 0 as an, an example. And here it would be the full width and the full height at the bottom right. Uh, so Jumping into this AMAT method, uh, what we'll do is set a local variable called local cursor. And local cursor we'll need to create. So I'm just going to add this over here. And this is going to be a vec2, uh, vec2d. And we create this arrive.vec2d, which uh, is a vector size 2, from offset. And this is just a convenience method to create this uh, value. You can also pass in the x and y uh, directly if you need to. But it's using this offset value local position. And we're going to be using this local cursor in some of our calculations. OK, and to do those calculations, uh, we're going to be going a step further. And um, this would require us to do a bit more computation. So I'm going to copy in the code for the next step. If you remember, we're currently using this view transform to define our view, the area that we're painting in. What we need now is the inverse of that view, because uh, the inverse of that view will allow us to get the uh, translate the uh, cursor's position to the world position. So for example, if I'm hovering over here, this will give us a value in accordance to the window size, but we want a value in accordance to the game world size. And to do that operation, the easiest way is to create an inverted matrix. So here we have our view transform. We're creating an inverse for that view transform. And then we're creating this world cursor, multiplying it by the inverse view transform. 
And these last steps, I'm just going to comment out for now. We'll get to them in a second. But if I print the local cursor, and if I print the world cursor, hot restart, you can see that, uh, let's try again. You can see that uh, the first value, 2635, is a lot different to the value of minus 713 minus 2508. What this essentially means is it's giving you the value of the character or the world. And as you would imagine, if you start getting to the bottom here, it's getting closer to zero. And the reason for that is because we set up our view transform in such a way that the bottom left is essentially now the, the position of this world. This may seem complex, but in effect, it's just multiplying or inverting the matrix, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, quite easy to do. What we're doing is checking to make sure that we can invert the matrix. In calling the mat2d.invert will give a true or false whether you can invert it or not. Um, and then we're setting this inverse view transform by first initializing it and then setting the value. Calling invert like this, you pass in an out and an in value. The in is the value matrix you want to invert, and the out is the matrix you want to invert it to. So once this operation is complete, we'll get the inverted matrix. And to get the world cursor, you just multiply it, uh, multiply it, the inverse view tra transform by the local cursor transform. And now this is where that next step comes in, where we have this character look target, and we need to set that in uh, the game kit's world space. And to do that, we first need to get the correct uh, value. So uh, we will we'll need to get the component, sorry. So in our uh, constructor, we're going to be initializing the character root and the target. And the character root is the uh, character position, the components of the character, and the target is the component that is the target over here, this look. And this is the character. So as you can see, the character's bounding box is smaller and different to the character uh, artboard. And the look is also in a different position. So to do that, uh, it's very easy. You just need to, in a similar way to how you would get a state machine, you just call a component on the artboard and you pass in the correct names. So character is the character look is where the character is looking at. It's that target node. Okay, and then finally, uh, we can set these value <laughs> values, I should say. And I think actually, uh, let's not set this first. Let's just set this. If we now uh, click, you can see the character is following uh, the mouse. So depending on, oh, that was a, a mistake. Uh, oh, the reason it's a mistake is because we actually need to pop the character to look left when it goes left. So like after a certain point, you want the character to look left. But like at this stage, it's still like, uh, it's following the, the cursor correctly. So let's flip the whole axis so that the character essentially flips around the X axis and looks to the left if the cursor reaches a certain position. And that is where this code comes in. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, uh, adding this code. So the character direction will be one or negative one. One means it look, uh, he's looking right and negative one means he's looking left. And that's what this calculation is doing. We're getting the character X value which is the position the character is on screen. So for example, if we move to the left, the character X is changing to the, the left. And then eventually when the mouse reaches that position, the character is now flipping its scale. And we're doing that by calling the character root, which is this component, which is this, we get like this. And um, lost the code for that. Uh, setting the scale value to negative one. If you wanted to, you could set it to negative two. Uh, let's see what that would look like. You know, you can see it's like filling it out more in the uh, x-axis, like it's scaling it in the x-axis and not scaling it in the y-axis. Uh, 
So yeah, just to illustrate it. But yeah, that, we obviously don't want that. We just want to flip it. So now we have a character that's working correctly. But if you look closely, you can see that it's moving correctly, like left and right, the legs are moving correctly, uh, forward and backwards. But if you do the inverse and then move forward, the character is still moving backward. So we'll need to do one extra little uh, check to make sure that uh, you know the, the character is actually moving correctly. Uh, so at the bottom here, where we're setting the move input for the character, we're going to be multiplying it by the character's direction, which is going to be, uh, let's jump to that, negative one or minus one. Yeah, and sign just returns negative one or minus one as well. It's probably not needed. But now you can see, regardless of where we're looking at, the character is moving forward when he should. So that's just a small little extra step uh, to make it uh, fluent. Okay, and I do think that is the end of this section. Uh, don't see any comments, so let's proceed. Step six, and here it's getting fun. Here we are going to be uh, adding arrows. So uh, we'll allow our character to be actually shooting something, uh, as you'll see. Okay. Um, to begin, uh, we'll jump back into main.dart. And um, you know what, actually, yeah, let's do this now. Um, we're going to wrap our widget in another widget, and this is going to be called a listener. And I know this seems like very heavy when it comes to just like managing input, uh, but secondly, there are many ways you can do this, and I'm sure eventually we'll make an API that makes this easier. Um, but what we want to do is create an on pointer down event. And what this on pointer down will allow us to do is determine where a click is happening. So if we just print this event uh, and click, 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 you we have a problem. It's not registering, it's not printing anything. And the reason it's not printing anything is for click events to actually uh, occur by default, uh, Flutter needs to make sure there's actually something visible below it. And because we're not using Flutter's uh, Canvas API to print anything, um, Flutter doesn't see that there is anything. Uh, it's basically triggering, it's hitting like an, uh, something with an opacity of zero. So for the behavior, you need to set the hit test behavior to be opaque. So basically, uh, you just make sure that the click event is being registered, even if nothing is vi visible according to Flutter on screen. Okay, so now we get the print events and we're gonna jump back into this in a moment. We now need to create the methods that will uh, make the character actually shoot an arrow. And to start off with, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this arrow.dart. And the reason we're creating an entirely new file for this is because um, For this particular animation, uh, we can be instancing a lot of arrows. If you are firing a lot, you want to be creating them consecutively. And it's just going to be more convenient if we create a little helper class that does like some of the logic for us. And we're going to be delving into this uh, in more detail uh, in a moment. So you can kind of ignore this for now. I'm going to jump back into it. But know that this instances and instantiates a new artboard that is an arrow and then determines where to paint it. Then jumping back into Centaur game. Okay, we'll need to do a few things. Um, first off, we'll get uh, a fire input. So if we take a look at our character, you can see it has this input, which is a trigger called fire. So like each time you click it, uh, the character fires some, uh, an arrow. So we want to find that input as well. And then 
we'll create a new method. So below aim at, we'll create pointer down. And this will require us to include gestures. And then we'll call fire input dot fire. And back in main, we can now do the following. We can just say sense our painter dot, uh, what's it called? Pointer down. Uh, let's see why that doesn't work. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, null check. Uh, you can just add this question mark if in case it's null. But at this point, it definitely shouldn't be anyway. Uh, so now, if we do a restart, uh, actually a hot restart, sorry, and you click, you can see the uh, character is like firing, but the arrow isn't going anywhere. And that is because the animation is set up in such a way that the arrow disappears after you shoot it. And now we need to redraw the arrow and like determine its velocity and like continuously update its, its path and where it should be painting. But the animation is playing, so we're making some progress. Um, okay, next step. We'll need to know what the, car uh, what the uh, location is of the arrow. So this is a nice convenient way for us to determine where to be actually painting the arrow. And this is going to be arrive components as well. And where we get these components, this is where we'll initialize this as well. And if, yeah, it's calling on the character component arrow location. And if we take a look at the character somewhere here, I don't think I'm gonna find it now. Uh, somewhere here, there should be a component called arrow location. And that is the going to give us the world coordinates of where that arrow, arrow location is, <laughs> uh, at least in regards to where the, where the character is as well. And we're going to be using this in our calculation, as you'll see, to continue where uh, the animation leaves off to continue painting the, uh, uh, the arrow. OK. Um, so what we can do now is I'm going to copy in the final code, and then we can just discuss it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So after we play the animation, uh, file, why is file not fine? Guy okay, named that's underscore. OK, so what's happening now? First off, we need to create a new transform. And this is a mat2d. And we're doing that by getting the arrow's location and we're getting the world transform of that, OK? If that is null, we create a new arrive mat2d. And normally, it shouldn't be null, but um, but yeah. Uh, then after that, we get the uh, arrow artboard. And this is, as you can think, the arrow artboard, so the arrow that we have over here. And now we are creating a new instance of our arrow class. And this is what's going to just be the convenient way for us to easily create these arrows and advance them. And we'll explore this in a moment. And then finally, we need a way to like keep track of how many arrows we've uh, created. And for that, we're going to create a new set. So at the top over here, I'm creating a set of arrows. And then we'll just continuously add the arrows as we are creating them. So for example, if we now print arrows, uh, I don't want that, restart, you can see the instance gets more. Maybe we should print length. Cool. So we're creating more and more arrows. Okay. So we're instantiating more and more arrow artboards, but we now need to draw these artboards and we need to advance these artboards. And that is where the actual class comes in. Okay, so in this class, we're passing in a translation and we're passing in a heading. And the heading is going to be the directional heading, uh, essentially where we're pointing at. Yeah, if that makes sense. And we use part of this calculation and the calculation of where the character is. So we're offsetting, or not offsetting, we are 
making sure that if the character moves to the right, we are incorporating the X value by adding it to the vector to the, that is the translation value. And this transform is the arrows location. So this will make sure that when we instantiate it, it's, it's in the correct position, regardless of where the character is on screen as well. And the heading is going to be a value between zero and one for a vector 2D, both in the X and the Y that determines basically the angle at what it's, it's facing in. Okay, and then in the paint method, um, after we draw the character, we're gonna be drawing our arrows. So I'm just gonna say arrows. Okay, and if we actually shoot now, you should see it works. So I'll explain the code in a moment. But take note of the following. If we shoot up, you can see like it's slowly going down. Like it's it's not following like a straight path. So there is like some, um, that's factored in essentially the uh, weight of the arrow, like it slowly uh, would go down. Okay, and what's happening in uh, a process or logic, uh, like step by step is we're taking a for loop to go over all of the arrows that we have. And what we're doing is we're first checking to see if the arrow is dead. And we'll look at the code for that in a moment. But the thing that this does is we basically dispose of the arrow if it's no longer visible on screen. And if it is dead, we add this to this dead arrows uh, set over here, and then we dispose of the arrow. And the reason we add this to the set is because after this for loop, we uh, call um, remove all on the arrow set and we pass in the dead arrows. And uh, this may seem complicated, but the reason for that is because you can't modify a set while you are looping over it. So we loop over it, keep track of all the dead arrows, and then thereafter update our list of arrows to remove uh, all of the dead ones from it. But we're immediately disposing of it if it should be disposed. And then we're advancing the arrow, and then we're drawing the arrow. Cool, so let's explore what the advance does. As we saw, when we initialize the arrow class, we pass in the artboard, the heading, and the translation. Heading is where it's looking at, translation is what its world position is. And dispose, we saw that we dispose of the artboard uh, by calling the dispose method. And then we have these two getters. We have draws and is dead. And draws is whether we should draw it, and dead is whether it's dead. And these are conditional depending on some time. And the time is a Boolean, uh, no Boolean, it's a double that increases each frame with the elapsed second, okay? And um, so for example, we instantiate a new artboard, the time is initially set to be zero, we advance the animation, so we add the elapsed time, which if it's 60 FPS, uh, it will be 0 0.16, uh, 0, yeah, 0 0.16 milliseconds. Um, and eventually, we use this logic to determine if, if the arrow should still be shown or not. Um, you could do this in other ways as well. If draws, uh, so if it's not draws, we return. Otherwise, if it's dead, we also return uh, because we only want to draw after the animation finishes. So this is just like a quick way, kind of a hack, I guess, to only draw it after the animation is finished so that you don't see like two arrows on screen at once. There might actually be a slight delay between like it being visible. Yeah, worth exploring. Um, okay, so now this translation, uh, this is the position of the uh, arrow. Each frame, we are increasing it by the heading the elapsed seconds times 3000. If we were to make this 5000, then the arrow will shoot faster. That is just the speed of the arrow. Elapsed seconds, this will make sure that it moves smoothly, smoothly depending on the frame rates you have. Um, and the heading is the direction it's facing in. And then very importantly, each uh, frame, we are making the heading of Y a little bit smaller. So it's like essentially making a loop going down like this which you can't see in this instance, but I guess yeah, it won't work if we scale, sorry. Um, and then finally, we're normalizing the heading. And uh, normalizing it uh, will uh, 
just make sure that the unit vector is a, has a length of one. So for example, let's say the heading is pointing at a position of uh, 200, 300. It's, it's a lot. Um, what the normalization does is it maintains the vector's position uh, on a line, but that line's length will now be one. Uh, yeah, play around with this, uh, some F. <laughs> okay, but that's all we need. Now we have our arrow and it's shooting in space. Cool. I think that's the end of this section. The last one is going to be the uh, final section, and that's going to be drawing the apples and uh, sh shooting at them. Uh, okay, I don't see any comments, but hello, Jetender. I see you did access, oh, you had some questions about the game kit as well on our Discord channel, so thanks for joining. Um, cool, so step seven. Adding the apples. So we're gonna be doing the same as previously. I'm gonna start off by creating a new class called apples.darts and just pasting in the code. This is functionally the same. We are just passing in different values because the apples need uh, different things and they behave slightly differently. But the two important things is this advance uh, and the draw. And uh, other things of notes as well is again, the suppose, same as before, and this damage method, which will uh, trigger the explosion of the apple. Very interesting is that the advance is different. Previously, we uh, did the advance for the arrow in uh, the way that you would expect, you know, updating the translation. Um, and in the draw, we simply draw it depending on its current translation. So as you can see, uh, this is familiar by now, calling render.save, transform the arrow, and draw the arrow, and then restore the arrow. And the actual translation and calculation for this, I'll let you look at uh, this in your own time, but it's uh, just a series of mathematical or matrix multiplications to determine what the heading should be, or the position should be for the arrows transform. Um, what that means as well is like whether it should be looking like this or slowly going down, uh, changing its angle. The apples one is li luckily a lot uh, simpler. Uh, so we have our apples class. We're going to explore it more once we draw them. In the actual uh, main.dart, I don't believe we need to do anything. Nope, we don't. Uh, so we're going to jump into our game file. And first thing, similar to how we have a set of arrows, we're going to create a set of apples. And we'll add that class we made. And do, 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 do. where we have the scene bounds, we're also going to create a new uh, spawn apple bounds. Okay, and uh, I'm adding this for now just so that I don't forget. But we'll play around with this value a little bit, and I think it uh, will also put bounding boxes in a different perspective for you. So. We'll get back to this in a moment, but this is just creating an AABB. And then the last few steps is going to be <laughs> quite a lot, actually. Uh, do, do, do. This is a big method. <laughs> uh, the method is called spawn apples. Okay, and this is going to be the method that handles uh, us creating these apples step by step or each frame. And it may seem complex, but it actually isn't. Uh, so hold on for a moment. I think it would make sense for us to actually just get this painting on screen before uh, we, we do a bit more. Uh, because there's some conditional logic in these last steps, because this is where, as I mentioned at the start of the stream, you can be smart about the way that you draw your uh, Actually, I should say advance your state machines in a way that uh, it's better uh, performance for you. So now we are spawning the apples. If we shoot, 
nothing is happening because we don't have that logic yet to trigger uh, that an apple should be damaged. But uh, the things that we should take note of that has been added uh, now. Uh, the first one is uh, similar to how we advance our, uh, our, our arrows and our uh, character. Actually, we never advance the arrows. But similar to how we advance the character that's animating, we can also advance the apples. And here we have an option, uh, basically three options. We can either advance each single apple on its own, or we can advance all of them at the same time. And it's not really advancing them at the same time. It's using a method that is exposed through the arrive game kit that uh, is a more efficient way for you to advance multiple state machines at the same time. It's basically creating separate threads or uh, isolates for you and advancing these uh, consecu uh, consecutively. So instead of you doing it uh, one by one, it's just a faster way, uh, multi-threading the computation. The last one is uh, a way for you to draw all of the apples while advancing them at the same time. And we're gonna ex be exploring the last two. Uh, the character advancing that we saw here, uh, character.draw, this is the basic approach. Uh, it's not, sorry, not character draw, character state machine not advance. So this one, this is the most basic approach. You could do that for all of these as well, all these apples, but it's going to be more efficient to batch advance them. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, there's this uh, boolean called batch advance that you can set to true or false. And depending on whether uh, this should probably be called batch advance and render. So let's rename that. You can see batch advance and render. If it's true, we call arrive, arrive, batch advance and render. And this requires you to pass in a list of state machines, the elapsed seconds, and the render. So very similar to what we saw before, but we need to know or give it uh, all of the Apple state machines. Okay, And we're doing that by creating a map or calling map, which will return a new iterable on all of the Apple uh, apples we have. And the apple is a class type apple. Uh, we want the uh, state machine that is on the Apple instance, okay? And what this final map will return is uh, iterable, which is a list, uh, sort of, uh, of state machines that we're passing in, which is exactly what uh, it needs, okay? And for now, let's ignore this. But the curious thing here is it's advancing and rendering in a single call. So you'll see that we're not calling uh, draw on the apples, as an example. And we can note that by going to the Apple class. If we take a look at the, uh, the draw class, uh, da, 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 da. let's just see, make sure where we're calling this. Yeah, you can see that we're only calling draw if batch advance and render is false. This is just like for purely for demonstration purposes. Uh, so normally we wouldn't call it if this is true. And if we explore this draw method, it's exactly the same as what we have seen before. The only difference is, is we're translating the apple depending on the apple's translations, x and y value, and we're also offsetting it by the center of the apple uh, in its x and y uh, space. So that just means that we are making sure that we're drawing the apple in, in the correct position depending on like what its sensor is. Um, so if we take a look at the actual apple implementation, uh, it takes in an artboard, it takes a state machine, it takes in a trigger, which is called explode, and we can observe that that is in fact the case. Apple, we play the state machine. If we press explode, you can see uh, the trigger triggers the explosion. And then we finally have bounds, and the bounds is the bounds of the artboard, and we're just keeping that to be same as the artboard of bounds. The center is bounds.center, and center, that's just a convenient way for you to get the Vec2D on the bounds. And this is the interesting part. Because we are no longer using this draw to draw each and every single one, and then translating the renderer ourselves, we need to tell the game kit where the position is for this artboard. And because these 
uh, artboards, these apples, are not changing position, we only need to do that once. So when we uh, create this apple and we instantiate this class, we only need to do it one time. Say artboard, the render transform is going to be the translation minus the center. So just offset it slightly so that it's uh, centered correctly. And we don't need to do that each and every frame. We don't need to call renderer.translate each and every frame. And that is where that batch advance comes in because all we need to do with batch advance and render is do one single call, uh, pass in all the state machines, and it will take the current world transform of the artboard and just paint it for you at that position. You could also update that uh, each frame if you wanted to. But this works really well if you have static assets that the positions don't change. If we were to turn this as false and restart, you'll see, or restart, I should say, it's still the exact same, technically. <laughs> this batch advance and render is just a slightly more performant way to do it. And without that batch advance and render, that will mean that we also call the draw method. Okay, so we will keep batch advance and render on. And the last step for us is to make sure that we can actually destroy these apples when we hit them. So let me just get uh, the code. Okay, and for that, the calculation is going to happen in the arrow class. So we're gonna go back into our arrow class and in the advanced method, we'll pass in all of our apples because we need to we need the apples to determine if we're hitting them. And I'm gonna add the apples class and uh, yeah, then after this return, so after we assure that uh, we should be advancing the uh, animation, we want to do a check to see if we hit the apple or not. And we accomplish that very simplistically in this example. In a real game, well, de depending on what game you're making, but uh, you may want to use a different approaches to do it more optimally. But here, what we're doing is uh, we're looping over all of the apples that we have. We are taking the apples translation, uh, so it's world space, and we are subtracting the arrows translation, so this value over here, it's world space, and we are getting the squared length of that, okay? And we're checking to see if that is smaller than the apple radius squared. And you can see that this is a set uh, fixed value where the apple's radius is 50 and the apple radius squared is uh, a multiplication factor or factor of, of this value, the squared value of that. So if it's less than that, then we do damage. So not a very scientific approach to do it. Uh, this is just a purely an example. Um, but you would probably want to, if this was a more complex game, and this is what Joel uses and the Goblin Slayer game uses, you'd want to use a scene tree. And with a scene tree, uh, you'd be able to lay out your AABBs in the tree in a very uh, computationally effective way to determine if you are hitting an object or not. And for that, check out our documentation. We have docs on that, and we will be creating more tutorials on that as well. And you can also take a look at the other example games that make use of those techniques. Uh, that makes it a lot easier also to uh, do camera movements to determine if you should be rendering something on screen when it is visible, as opposed to just always drawing everything. And this is where uh, the batch advance versus batch advance and render comes into play. Because with render, you are always drawing it. With just batch advance, you are only advancing the artboard. And this is where you can kind of be smart about, maybe you want to advance uh, the artboard, but you don't want to render it. And if you, want, if you can save on the computational resources, then that is, that is a win. Okay, but now we're passing in the apples and we're determining if we should hit it. If it is uh, within range, the arrow points to the apple, we damage the apple. Uh, so in our sensor game, we need to do that. We need to pass it in, I believe, yeah. So when we call arrow.advance, we just pass in all of our apples. 
I think that's all that's needed. If we, uh, yeah, now you can see it's actually damaging them correctly. And it's a slight delay. And the reason for that is because, um, I mean, it's it's not scientific how we're doing it now. <laughs> uh, we, we just set a value of 50. Uh, so depending on the size of this window and also depending on the size of uh, the bounds that we set, uh, it may be different. But I did promise that we'll get back to the spawn apple bounds. Uh, and also, let's just make the game world bigger. Okay, <laughs> now it's really small. Uh, it's not going to work well for live stream. Uh, we'll set it back to one. Um, you move, lost my space, sorry. Yeah, the spawn apple bounce. Uh, this is an interesting use of AIBB um, because what we're doing here is we're determining where the apple should spawn in. And we're doing that by getting the minimum and maximum size of our scene bounds. So the minimum could be like something negative, something weird, and the maximum could be like at the bottom right here, something maximum really, really big. But what we want to do is determine that our bound should be within like just a portion of that screen, if that makes sense. For example, if we set this to be zero for the maximum and uh, actually, let's increase our spawn frequency. So spawn apples. Uh, I still need to touch this method. So I'll let not to do. Uh, we'll spawn five apples at, at a time. And uh, we're also going to go a little bit crazy. Oh, we're already doing 2,000. I think that's enough. But you can see now it's spawning five apples at a time. And you can see some of them are like spawned uh, at, from zero up. And this is what this bounds is doing. Uh, it's just a way for us to be like, okay, uh, we don't want it spawning here because th this is where the character is. Uh, that is why we gave it an artificial value of 600. And now I can't find it. Here we go. So we'll put this back to 600. If we wanted to make this 700, now it's going to be this very small space where we are spawning in all of our apples. So yeah, just a, a, a cool way for you to uh, make use of, of AABB calculations. OK, the spawn apples thing, I think you can probably figure that out for the most part on your own. But uh, here we are only spawning apples if a cooldown condition is met. So if we want to be a little bit crazy, we can spawn in a lot by reducing that cooldown time. And if we wanted to, you know, increase the amount of apples and increase our radius, yeah, now we're spawning in a lot. Uh, at the radius, uh, this not radius. The size is probably too much. We probably can't see most of them. Uh, let's just make this a thousand two hundred. But okay, I don't want to do that because uh, it's too distracting. We'll keep it at negative 500 milliseconds, and we'll keep this locked at a thousand for now. Um, in the spawn apple bounds, we have the stopwatch that we reset and start. This is determining if we should spawn, creating a random value, and then uh, we're using the uh, spawn apple bounds to determine the range of uh, where we can spawn in. And depending on that range, that is like uh, determining a random spawn position for these apples. And uh, this is just a conditional thing to determine uh, how many apples we should spawn per uh, cycle. And we're getting the apple outboard, getting the apple state machine, getting the apple uh, the state machine's trigger explode, and then we're creating our apple outboard, uh, apple class, sorry. And we're passing in the translation which this is where the random calculation takes effect, uh, depending on our minimum and maximum bounds. And then we add it to our list of sets of apples. Spawn counts just keeps track of how many we've spawned. And that is the logic. That is essentially the game uh, for the most part. I think it makes sense to maybe, uh, yeah, just make it a little bit bigger and yeah, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Now would be the time to ask them. 
uh, or if you have requests for uh, tutorials in the future or things you would like to find out more about. Uh, I'm very excited or, about the game kits and I'll be happy to answer any of those. Okay. Um, I think this has probably gone on long enough. Uh, last few minutes to leave a question if you have any. Thank you for watching and I do hope that you have enjoyed this live stream. Um, I'm really excited to see what people start creating with the game kits. I think this definitely unlocks uh, some new possibilities um, as opposed to, uh, well not as opposed to, but the fact that you can print a, a lot more or paint a lot more. Okay, a question came through. Why Flutter as the starting platform? It's an excellent question. Um, part of the reason is uh, the fact that the Arrive editor is made with Flutter. So uh, the tool you use to create these Arrive animations, that is built using Flutter. And um, that means that we uh, have a large priority to get the new Arrive renderer which again, if you want more information, take a look at this page. It's a big priority to get this in the Flutter uh, or the Arrive editor that is made in Flutter, because uh, that would mean that the editing experience would also be a lot better. So you won't as easily run into any performance issues. And it would also allow us to do more advanced uh, operations that people are, have requested. For example, uh, blurs and shadows. Um, so that's part of the reason why Flutter for the game kit. We need that uh, technical, uh, we needed to do the work to get it in the editor. And now we also, uh, um, aside from that, Flutter made sense from other perspectives as well. One of it is the fact that it's uh, multi-platform. Um, the fact that the game kit was relatively easily to get working in uh, on in Flutter, uh, the fact that we enjoy using Flutter, and the fact that Flutter is very is a very modern language uh, with a lot of nice development features that uh, engineers may want. If you want to know more, we wrote an article why we chose Flutter. Uh, you can read this article; it provides uh, more information on why Flutter. But it's an excellent question. The end goal is to get the renderer running everywhere. And the game kit, for now, is just uh, a way for you to use the renderer. OK, Jatender asked, I have one question. Will the performance remain Will performance remain same when we build games for mobile and Flutter with so many apples rendering? Uh, excellent question. Um, we can technically already target uh, iOS, I've very funnily, like I've never done it though. Um, let's launch a simulator. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, yes. Uh, we, uh, I have a version of Joel uh, on my phone um, that Joel the game that runs really smooth. Um, Obviously, the more resources you have, the more you can do. Uh, obviously, for memory, uh, running on a computer is going to allow you to be more generous in how much memory you have and the assets you use and how many things you can paint and how many consecutive things you can do. Uh, might also have an impact if you do uh, multi-threaded work. Uh, but the what we found with the game kit is that it's running really fast on iOS. Um, obviously, yeah, uh, won't be as fast as, as a new uh, M1 or M2 macOS app, but uh, yeah, will be it will be fast. Uh, Seuss is asking when's the game kit going to be available for public so we can play with it. Uh, it's also an excellent question. Um, I don't know if you watch the other streams, but we have a thing that we say soon, uh, sooner meter, 
So I I can't I can't <laughs> I can't promise how soon. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm running into like a debug issue. Uh, building for iOS. So I can't demo that right now, but uh, yeah, iOS is already supported. Um, when public, uh, I don't know. Um, for now, it's it's under uh, closed testing. So if you want access, please apply, and please state why you would like to use it. Um, and uh, definitely looking for uh, folks that's going to be creating um, something from to completion, essentially. Okay, um, I think let's call it there. Uh, thank you guys for joining, and uh, yeah, uh, excited for the future of the Rive Game Kids. Uh, see you in the next live stream.